Hello and welcome to Face to Face. Um, our guest today is uh, Annie Michon. Annie is uh, on a tour of Canada. Uh, she lives in Germany, but originally from Britain, England. Um, she joined uh, the British Military Intelligence Group, MI5, uh, shortly after leaving university in the early 1990s. Annie spent six years in MI5, and in 1996 left the organization because of things she had seen there that uh, she just didn't feel were right. Uh, she became a whistleblower, and um, Annie, maybe you can start off by telling us why you left uh, MI5. Mm, um, well, it was a sort of incremental process, really. Uh, when I joined MI5 in, the 19, in 1990, when I was being recruited, they told me repeatedly that the service had to obey the law, that they no longer investigated people for their political activism, and um, they'd been put on a legal footing for the first time, only the year before, in 1989, with the Security Service Act. So it sounded like quite a good job. Oh, they also said that I would be working as a counter-terrorism officer, no more sort of political investigations. So it sounded like a good job that would make um, a difference, you know, help protect people, um, stop terrorists putting bombs down, that sort of thing. So it was quite attractive, and I signed up to it. And then over a period of six years, which involved three different postings to different sections, I saw so many things going wrong. Um, it was a bit like a sort of boiling a frog syndrome, where things got worse and worse, that in the end... I decided to resign. Um, I also met my partner, ex-partner, David Shaler, who was also working there as an intelligence officer. And he was equally disillusioned by 1996. And we both resigned together. And we'd already taken the decision to blow the whistle on the crimes that we saw committed by the spies. So when you say blow the whistle on the crimes committed by the spies, mm -hmm. there were things going on within MI5 mm -hmm. that you felt were not only morally wrong, but actually illegal. Illegal, yes. Can Not you... just MI5, but also an MI6, which is a sort of external intelligence gathering agency in the UK. Uh, in our first section in F2, we we're actually looking at political activism. And there were files held on a number of politicians that we came across. And the reason we saw those was because there was a general election in 1992. And in that case, anyone who stands as a potential MP has their name checked against MI5's records. If those records throw up a file, that file is pulled out of registry and reviewed. And at that time, of course, there were many, many people in the Labour Party who wanted to be Labour MPs who had in their fiery youths been radical left-wing activists. So many of them had files. And we're looking at the great and the good of the Labour Party who have been in power since 1997 now. Anyone who's been through the Labour Party cabinet in the government over the last decade has pretty much had an MI5 file. And I think that's the initial problem we saw because that is an issue for a democracy where the politicians who are supposed to hold the spies to account are worried about what the spies hold on their files. And I think every time we see um, the government giving more power, resources, staffing levels to MI5 and MI6, I'm sure part of it is, you know, their guilty little secrets rattling around in the back of their heads. And they think, you know, I better not cross these guys. They're very powerful and they know all about me. So that was one issue. Uh, we also saw when we were both working in the Irish section, working on IRA terrorism and loyalist terrorism, a number of um, operations that could or well, could and should have prevented bombings, which didn't. So explosions occurred on the UK mainland because MI5 and the police weren't up to doing their job. But the major criminality really came in um, the last postings we had, which was to a section called G Branch. And that looks at international terrorism. And David particularly was uh, aware of these because he was the head of the Libyan section in MI5 at that time. And he came across three examples of um, illegality and false flag terrorism. The first one was an illegal operation against a left-wing journalist in the UK, a very prominent left-wing journalist called Victoria Britton, who worked for the Guardian newspaper. And she was involved in um, channeling funds into a libel case. But the person she was representing was, a, I think, a Nigerian who had links to some Libyans. So uh, MI5 senior management got terribly excited about this and said, oh, it's great, you know, we can investigate a lefty. And without going through the necessary procedures, started an investigation into her, which included an illegal telephone tap, which went on for about six months and which cost the taxpayer about three quarters of a million pounds. And it was all illegal. And David tried and tried to shut this operation down, eventually succeeded, but it was a gross invasion of this woman's privacy and broke all the rules and the law that MI5 was supposed to work within. Uh, but the two cases that really got us, first of all, there was a, a false flag attack in London in 1994, where a car bomb exploded outside the Israeli embassy 
in the centre of London. Now, I remember this vaguely. Mm. This is, uh, we're talking 14 years ago. It's a long time but ago. But it was yeah. huge at the time. I mean, it was a huge worldwide story. Yeah, yeah. In fact, there'd been um, an earlier attack against some Jewish interest section in Buenos Aires earlier that year as well. Similar sort of MO, um, modus operandi, with a car bomb driven and parked outside that exploded. So in 1994, a car bomb explodes outside the Israeli embassy in London. In London, yeah. Anyone hurt or killed? I don't remember. Very minor injuries, that was all. Okay. Nobody was killed. And um, it was a very sophisticated device. It appeared to eat itself, eat all the forensics. Now, this is very, very rare. Even the IRA, which is a very sophisticated terrorist organisation, could not make bombs that um, effective. Um, so it looked like a you know, sort of fairly technical person had put that together. But what emerged from that, um, the senior MI5 officer, who was in charge of the investigation into it um, and had seen all the evidence but also all the intelligence, which isn't necessarily admissible in court, wrote his formal assessment at the end of the case. And he said he reckoned that Mossad, the Israeli external intelligence agency, had bombed their own embassy, a sort of extra, uh, controlled explosion outside the embassy. And as I said, that was a senior MI5 officer. That was his formal verdict. If you read that on the internet now, you would say that sounds like some mad conspiracy theory. But it wasn't. This was the official position of MI5. And he said that they did it for two reasons. One, they were always hassling MI5 for increased security around their embassy and other interests in London. Because, of course, London had a, a reputation of giving safe haven to Arab distance from around the world at that point. And MI5 kept saying, well, there's no reason to increase the threat assessment. You don't need extra protection. So letting off a controlled explosion outside, of course, they immediately got what they wanted there. But crucially, two innocent Palestinians were arrested, charged and convicted of conspiracy to cause that attack. And they were very active in a Palestinian support network in London, political campaigning for the people on the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And they were gaining some traction in the media. They were getting quite a lot of support. So by arresting these people and framing them from an attack and sticking them in prison, the whole network just shattered and hasn't got back on its feet to this day. So that would be a clear political advantage for Mossad to have achieved in London by framing these innocent people for an attack which was carried out by Mossad. Where are these two people now? They're still rotting in prison. So they've been in prison for 14 years. Yeah, and they both got 20-year sentences. They both proclaim their innocence. They will serve the whole sentence. And it was a young woman called Samar Alami who's had a breakdown since this case, for obvious reasons, and a young man called Jawed Botme. And, um, they were found guilty of, the, of conspiring, being... conspiring to cause the attack. Not actually doing it. They had cast iron alibis. But the linkage was a mysterious figure who was known as Raider Magrabi. And um, he was a man, uh, apparently Middle Eastern, who befriended many people within this Palestinian support network. And Jawed Botme knew a little bit about second-hand cars. So Raider Magrabi asked him to go along to an auction and help him buy a second-hand car. So Jawed did. This was the car that was used in the explosion. This was the linkage that pulled these Palestinians into the case. And, of course, during the investigation, Raider Magrabi just disappeared. So the speculation would be that, actually, this guy was a Mossad person. So that was a pretty shocking case. Um, now, this, I think, carries tremendous importance today mm. because there's a lot of concern around the world about these false flag operations. And maybe you can just explain what a false flag operation is. Mm. Well, it's a phrase that comes, from, I think, from an old uh, naval tradition where sailing boats would go in under one flag of a different country to deceive the enemy and get close and then attack them. Um, but false flag is basically the concept where you, an attack happens, some sort of terrorist atrocity, which is blamed on one party, but is actually planned, organised or paid for by another party, quite often an intelligence agency. And it's a perfectly standard weapon in the arsenal of intelligence agencies. They use false flag all the time. Um, so people really shouldn't be shocked by the idea that this can occur. Uh, the case that made Shayla and I actually quit MI5 was a very stark case of false flag <coughs> terrorism. And as I said, he was the head of the Libyan section in 1995, and he developed unusually friendly relations with his counterpart in MI6, which is the external service. And he was briefed by his counterpart on an unfolding plot where there had been a volunteer from the Lib Libyan military intelligence agency who had said he would like to try and stage a coup in Libya, but he needed support from MI6. Uh, financial support in order to carry out this coup attempt. And if he did succeed with MI6's backing, 
then he would hand over the Lockerbie Two suspects, who were still wanted at that point. And of course, it would smooth the path to greater business contracts, you know, particularly in the oil fields with British Petroleum. So MI6 leapt at this and they started funding what was effectively an Al Qaeda cell in Libya to try and assassinate Colonel Gaddafi in 1996. And they threw about $120,000 um, at this group for them to buy the equipment to carry out the coup, you know, explosives, guns, jeeps, tents, whatever. And David was briefed about this all the way through the plot, all the way through the plot. But he was, you know, fairly unsure if it would actually go ahead. I mean, MI6 were always coming up with these sort of crackpot schemes and never actually doing anything. Uh, but he did brief his, his um, bosses um, just to make sure that his back was covered. He said, look, this is what they're planning on doing. Anyway, um, in early 1996, he was sitting at his desk in MI5 and all these reports started coming in from different sources saying there had indeed been an attack against Colonel Gaddafi's cavalcade. Now, the, car, the explosion had occurred underneath the wrong car, obviously, because Gaddafi's very much alive. But innocent people were killed in the car and innocent people were killed in the ensuing security shootout. And when David challenged his MI6 counterpart, you know, was this what you were talking about? He said, yes, that was our man, we did it. Well, of course they didn't, <laughs> but I think they were just pleased that they'd actually done something, even if they didn't achieve their objective. Um, and this was the case that just worried us so much because we had joined MI5 to try and stop terrorism, not to get involved in agencies that carried out terrorism, particularly uh, false flag terrorism, you know, where they were paying this Al-Qaeda cell with no links to Osama bin Laden, who were even then perceived to be a threat by MI5, money to try and assassinate in an illegal operation a foreign head of state. I mean, that's just... So about the most this, heinous this, sort of crime yeah. you can commit. So this bears repeating. Here is MI6, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I guess, comparable to the American CIA, CIA yeah. uh, funding uh, an assassination attempt mm -hmm. against the prime minister of Libya. The head of state, yeah. The head of state, uh, killing innocent people mm -hmm. in it. Mm -hmm. um, and you said funding that the people who were trying to carry this out were members or linked to Al-Qaeda. Yeah, they were... Um, when as, did this all happen? This happened in 95, 96. 1995, 96, yeah. okay. So, yes, we're talking of a ragtag group of Islamic extremists, some of whom had links to Al-Qaeda, to Osama bin Laden's organisation at that time. So, it's, I mean, it was an amazing, amazingly awful thing to have been funded by MI6. But crucially as well, it was an illegal operation under UK law. I mean, it was immoral and it was reckless as well, but it was illegal under UK law because... Um, under the 1994 Intelligence Service Act, which regulates the work of MI6, there is indeed actually a licence to kill. I mean, that's one of the true things out of James Bond. We all Bond. know that. <laughs> um, but in this case, if you get the prior written permission from their political master, which is the Foreign Secretary in the UK, um, they get legal immunity for illegal acts they carry out abroad. And they didn't get this permission, so it's an illegal operation they were involved in too. So yes, we're looking at... Um, an illegal operation to assassinate a foreign head of state, which funds our terrorist enemies at the time, which goes wrong and kills innocent people. How much worse can you get? Um, so that's classic false flag. And that's why Shayla and I left MI5, and that's why we blew the whistle. Okay. I'd just like to go back to these, this idea of false flag operations, mm -hmm. because I think we have to look at everything that happens throughout the world mm -hmm. as potentially a false flag operation. You know, we're told by our media, especially here in Canada, mm -hmm. which is, which is uh, uh, so one-sided in their presentation, when something happens, they say, yes, it was done by these guys, obviously. Mm -hmm. But we always have to consider, as citizens of a country, especially of a s supposedly democratic country, that this may just be a trick, a game, in Absolutely. order to make us think something and in order to allow certain powerful interests to get what they want. Very much so. I mean, as I said, false flag um, terrorism is perfectly normal. I mean, this is what the intelligence agencies do. And there are many, many other cases of it. For example, the, um, you remember the case of Alexander Litvinenko, the ex-KGB no. officer who was poisoned with polonium-210 in London? Yes, with yeah. an umbrella or something. Uh, yeah, poison tea. He was, poison uh, got tea, okay. radiation poisoning and was killed. And um, he was always rather coyly called a sort of Russian dissident in the UK. He was living in London. He'd fled Russia to London for safe sanctuary. But in fact, what he was was a whistleblower. And one of the things he'd blown the whistle on was KGB involvement in, blo in, in bombing um, some apartment blocks in Moscow in 1999, oh, which was yes. then blamed on Chechen rebels. And this was the pretext that Russia needed to invade Chechnya in a very bloody uh, war. 
um, that violated all sorts of all sorts of basic human rights and everything. It was awful. Anyway, that was based on a lie. The KGB bombed their own apartments, killed hundreds of people in order to invade another country. Or you have, for well, example, let's just let's just mm. focus on that one for a few minutes, mm -hmm. because I, I do remember the war against Chechnya, mm. and I remember very clearly the blowing up of apartment buildings within Russian cities yeah. that was then blamed on Chechnyan terrorists yeah. and used as an excuse by the Russian government to attack mm -hmm. uh, Chechnya. And even at the time on the internet, there were, there were a few stories you know, seemingly coming from credible sources mm -hmm. saying that in fact Russian secret police or the police whoever had been caught by accident in the basement of, some, of one of these apartment buildings. That's right, yeah, yeah with the bombs in their hands mm -hmm. and then let go once, you know, once it was realized who they were working for. Mm -hmm. This was no secret. Mm. I mean, our own media, at the high end of our media, must have known the true story, but the true story was never told here. Mm. Clearly, because uh, the Russian invasion of Chechnya was something that was going to be allowed by the West. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I mean, another interesting case was the Oklahoma City bombing. You know, when... Timothy McVeigh, who has, I think, been put to death for that attack. Um, so they tell us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was convicted of, of um, carrying it out. But in fact, if you go back and look at the um, archive media coverage from that day, all the media initially said, oh, it's Al-Qaeda. That's right. That's what they were briefed on, I was supposed to say. And McVeigh was caught by accident for some traffic violation. Completely caught yeah. by accident. That's so, right. you know, if that hadn't happened, we would still be saying, oh, it's an Al-Qaeda suicide bombing. That's right. So these things go on all the time. And it's almost like the media have become part of the establishment of the system. They're no longer the fourth estate holding the system to account. And I mean, I suppose the most notorious example, certainly in the UK, that we saw of media spin and intelligence lies was in the run-up to the Iraq war, where um, we had a case made for war that was flawed. It was based on um, wrong intelligence, um, where the intelligence agencies and the Labour government span the media to such an extent that on the eve of the election in Parliament to see whether or not RMPs would vote to take us into war, we had headlines saying, uh, 45 minutes from Armageddon, as in Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction, which he can then deploy within 45 minutes against British interests, which is all a lie. But all these were the lie. newspaper headlines on the eve of the vote about whether to go to war. And it came out of the Labour spin machine, it came out of the intelligence agencies. And um, it's something we all need to be aware of, quite how controlled the media is by the spies as well as by the governments. There are various means and ways of, of doing that. So we have to keep in mind at all times that what we're being told mm -hmm. simply may not be true. You've got to keep an open mind because the story we're told in the media is simply that, many times, a story. Which isn't to say that it's always a story, that would be too simple. Yeah. But many, many times, the information, and it was the same here in Canada mm -hmm. and in the United States, mm -hmm. the, uh, we, you know, the invasion of Iraq was based on absolute and total lies, and no one has ever really been held to account for yeah. that. Well, it's also interesting as well with the scandal of the um, torture cases that's been rocking America over the last couple of weeks where it has become plain that some of the suspects were tortured because the administration in the US wanted evidence that linked al-Qaeda um, and the 9-11 attacks to Saddam Hussein. They wanted to torture people into saying, yes, there was a link, so they could justify an invasion of Iraq on that basis. When they couldn't get that justification because it didn't exist, that's when they fabricated the intelligence about weapons of mass destruction. So, you know, they found another excuse to go into Iraq, again, based on a lie, but that was spun successfully in the media to begin with. So it's, uh, it's a worrying situation. I mean, there's, um, there's a section in MI6 called Information Operations, uh, which is sort of shortened down to IOPS, which is designed deliberately to manipulate the media in the UK, where they plant fake stories and where they spin stories and massage stories that they want to, want to control. <clears throat> so there are official mechanisms for um, manipulating the mainstream media, certainly in the UK, and I'm sure it's mirrored um, in the US and Canada. Well, here I don't know if they even have to go to the trouble of manipulating the media. I think the media, <laughs> the ownership of the media mm -hmm. is just part of the, the elite that runs the country. Yeah. And decisions are made by all three of them together, the, mm -hmm. the corporations, the government, and the media. Very much so, but they should yeah. be the fourth estate holding those other people yes. to account. That's supposed to be their job. Yes, and it's very dangerous in a mm -hmm. democracy, so-called, yes. when we no longer have a media that's free to do that. Mm. Um, maybe you can just tell us what MI5 
is supposed to do, what its, what its jobs are supposed to be. MI5 is supposed to protect national security. Um, it's supposed to assess um, what the threats are. So it tends at the moment, I think, to look at counter-terrorism of various flavours, counter-proliferation of weapons like biological warfare, chemical warfare, nuclear warfare. Um, I think they still have a slight responsibility for organised crime um, and counter-espionage. And that's their job, effectively. Um, and also in the past, of course, they have looked at political activists. And they shut that pretty much down in the 1990s. But I'm willing to bet they have, since the Stop the War Coalition, the whole peace movement, has become much more vibrant. I think they're probably looking at that a little bit more again. Oh, you see, so they're checking into people who are... Who Exercising are, their democratic rights by doing political protest. Yes, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> it's not good, it's not good. But that's what they're supposed to do. Um, but they are a law unto themselves. There is no real oversight in the UK at all. Um, if you work for the agencies and you witness crime, there is nowhere you can turn to to report that crime, apart from the head of the agency. So you can imagine how far that would go. Um, there is a committee in Parliament called the Intelligence and Security Committee, which can only look at policy, administration and finance. It can't investigate any other allegations, and which is only appointed by the Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister vets its report. So that's it. There's no accountability. So who does MI5 work, not only work for, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, CSIS, our Canadian Security Intelligence Service, is probably in the same boat. Not only who do they work for, meaning who are they responsible to, mm -hmm. but in whose interests are they working? Yeah, that's an interesting question. They tend to work very much in their own interests. They have evolved historically in the UK. Okay. Um, in a very sort of British model, where we have these agencies which aren't terribly good at their jobs, which are very closed shop in their mentality, so they don't like criticism or new ideas. And um, they're not really up to their job. So what we need, perhaps, is a more informed debate in the UK, where people say, well, OK, what are the real threats to our country and how can we best police them? And perhaps we need to rethink the structure of our intelligence community, because it's, you know, different agencies competing and fighting for, for turf and prestige and power. Um, as to who they actually work for, pretty much themselves, they want to guard their empire. They want to preserve their status, their resources. Um, they talk about serving the national interests, but actually it tends to overlap with um, their, their interests, pretty much. And it's very much a sort of um, old school tie type environment still, where they go to the right universities or the right schools and they have friends in places like government, in the media, in the city, and they serve each other's interests. They don't, they're not working for the good of the country in terms of the people of the country. Is it then the interests of big business that in the end they're working for? I think the British class system is more subtle than that. It's not just business or politics or whatever. It's all these interlinkages through family, through schooling, what have you. Um, so it's, it's more to say they would be working for the interests of the establishment, which is made up of all these interlinking groups, and of which they are part as well. We're talking with Annie Michon. Uh, Annie is on tour of Canada right now as we speak uh, in May 23rd, I think, when we're, when we're filming this. Um, Annie was in uh, British military intelligence, MI5, uh, left as a whistleblower, um, and um, I'd just like to ask you, have, do you feel you've paid a heavy price for what you did? Because what you did, takes it, it takes a lot of courage to be a whistleblower, even if you're working for a company. But mm, mm. to go against an organization like MI5... Uh, yeah, <laughs> it was pretty frightening, it has to be yeah. said. It must have been a very difficult decision to make. Yes, yes, it was. Um, but I think faced with something like the Gaddafi plot, it's just such a stark example of false flag terrorism, of what of precisely what the intelligence agencies, agencies should not be involved in, um, that we really had no choice. But yes, the price that was paid was very high. I mean, uh, if you're a whistleblower from a, co a corporation, you have certain protections under the, the law. If you're a whistleblower from MI5 or MI6, you are the criminal, because there is a piece of law called the Official Secrets Act, and if you um, speak to anyone ever about your work, then you have broken that. There is no defence under law. So even if you're reporting murder on the part of the spies, you are the criminal, not the murderers. It's that simple. So effectively what we had to do was flee the country. I mean, we went to the newspapers because there was no official channel to go to, apart from the head of the agencies. We went to the papers, one, because we thought they could campaign for an inquiry into some of these issues, more effectively than just two lone people. 
And two is a form of protection. You know, once you're in the public eye, you have a certain degree of protection. Um, but that meant as well that we uh, fled the country with one day, one day ahead of the story breaking. And um, Shayla and I literally were on the run around Europe for a month, during which time the secret police, the spe special branches, had broken into our flat and had ripped it apart in a counter-terrorism style search. Um, I mean, literally, you know, the pipes out of the bath, the floorboards up, everything. And they took away things like our bed sheets, my underwear. It was just horrible. It was quite violating. Um, and they also took an injunction out against the media to stop further disclosures from Shayla. Um, so we're on the run. I went back to pack up the flat and sort out our lives. I was arrested, of course. Um, his brother was arrested. Two of his best friends have been arrested. Student supporters have been arrested. Journalists have been arrested. It was a big case that rippled out. So there's quite a lot of intimidation going on. And we ended up having to live in hiding in a French farmhouse for a year. And then um, he was imprisoned in Paris because the British tried to extradite him from France and failed. And then we had another two years living in Paris where we campaigned for an inquiry into the Gaddafi plot and pushed it as far as we could. And during that time as well, there was a leak from MI6 of a document that proved the Gaddafi plot, which you would think would be quite conclusive in the need for a new inquiry into the issue and everything. And the government managed to spin its way out of it, just so it's fantasy, you know. So we had two years living in exile. David was actually literally stuck in France at that point. And um, he went back voluntarily in 2000, expecting to be put on trial for a breach of the Official Secrets Act, but fairly rapidly, you know, within six months. But they dragged him through this whole series of pre-trial hearings so that when he came in front of a jury over two years later, he wasn't allowed to say why he'd done what he'd done. He wasn't allowed to mention the Gaddafi plot believe it or not, even though that was the reason he'd done it. Um, and he wasn't allowed to freely cross-examine his accusers. So MI5 officers were in court anonymously um, giving evidence and he had all these questions for them and the judge and the prosecutor vetted them and crossed them all out. So he couldn't actually cross-examine the prosecution witnesses. And then the judge ordered the jury to convict, which goes against all precedent in British law. I mean, the jury can acquit in the interest of justice if it so chooses, but they were ordered to convict. So it was a bit of a kangaroo court. So he, of course, went to prison again. And he also um, had his reputation shredded, I suppose, is the best way, by the media, the mainstream media, because it was bad enough he got convicted and went to prison. But the judge in his formal ruling at the end of the case said he accepted that David Shaler um, had done what he'd done in the public interest that there was no financial motivation and that no lives had been risked in the process of the disclosures. Nobody's life had been put at risk. And that was the judge's view. And the journalists were sitting in the courtroom writing it all down. And yet the headlines on the papers the next day said precisely the opposite. They said, Shayla sells agent lives down the river for money. I was just thinking, hey, was I in the same courtroom watching these people write down the... Yeah. the and the it's ruling. not really the reporters because it doesn't matter what they write. Exactly. It's, it's whoever runs the newspaper decides on the headlines. Exactly. So, of course, you have the government and the intelligence agencies telling them what to do. So, you know, he was convicted. He was sentenced. He was sent, sent to a high security prison. <laughs> and, he, and, of course, he had his reputation destroyed as well in the papers. So it was a very high price and... Um, you know, it's been a, a constant struggle just to keep our heads above water over those years financially to survive. Um, and also we separated, sadly, uh, about three years ago. And since then, I gather he's had some sort of breakdown as well. I mean, some sort of psychosis where he's announced he's the Messiah or something. It's quite a common um, psychosis, I believe. But it's just so sad to see someone who had such a fine mind and such a principled stance. Yes, yes. To be well, sort who of knows what they did to him like in that. prison? Mm. You know, who knows? Yeah, so in terms of the price he's paid. So I think, I mean, the lesson for us here in Canada, here in British Columbia, mm. is don't believe the headlines you read Absolutely. in the newspapers, <laughs> for one. And, yeah, and uh, also don't believe what I'm saying. I mean, all I'm saying to people is use your own minds. You know, go out and read for yourself and research issues that you're interested in for yourself and don't just take everything at face value. Yes. You know? We've got to be thinking individuals, taking a, an active part in our democracy, not just passively consuming the lies that government and big business want us to believe. Yes, well said. Um, maybe we can talk for a minute about the issue of 9-11, mm. because when we're talking about fla false flag operations, <laughs> and just for those who are tuning in late, a false flag operation is simply an operation carried out, let's say, by the U.S. government, mm -hmm. 
but blamed on someone else, like, for example, blamed on Al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. So what's your take on the events of 9-11? Um, well, I came quite late to looking at 9-11. Um, in 2005, I was approached by a leading UK activist um, uh, from the sort of 9-11 group saying, well, you know, you've blown the whistle on these false flag attacks. Have you ever looked at this issue? Um, I said, well, actually, we've been a bit sort of busy fighting court cases and things. But anyway, I will go and have a look. And I went off and I read um, a book called The New Pearl Harbor by David Ray Griffin, which just raises so many questions about the official account. Um, it got me thinking. And of course, once you accept that false flag is an historic reality, and it is, I mean, there are many, many cases of it, 9-11, um, you have to approach that issue with that in the back of your mind at the very least. You know, was there something more to it or should we just believe what the mainstream media immediately told us, which is it's Al-Qaeda? As I said, there is so much evidence out there, a mountain of evidence from credible experts that contradicts the official account that I would say to anyone that at the very least we need a new independent inquiry into the issue. I mean, we have academics, we have scholars, we have um, politicians, including the leader of the opposition in Japan, are raising questions and saying we need a new inquiry. Um, we have pilots, we have architects and engineers who question the way the, the towers fell, the three towers fell down on that day. Yes, a lot of people don't know that three buildings yeah, fell yeah. on the day of 9-11, the, the two uh, World Trade Center 1 and mm -hmm. World Trade Center 2, which everybody saw, and also World Trade Center 7, mm -hmm. which collapsed about 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. that day, New York time, announced in advance by the BBC. And the CNN a and a few other... Oh, and yeah, CNN. Yeah, a couple okay. of other stations as well. Um, yes, that was a, that's a big mystery. You know, we have this 47-story skyscraper, which is huge. It just looked small next to the Twin Towers, um, which just collapses at freefall speed, um, it implodes in the middle and collapses into its own footprint. Now, people who've seen the footage of that collapse, who are experts in demolition, but they don't realise it's a World Trade Center tower, just say, yeah, of course that's controlled demolition, don't be silly. When they're told it's from the World Trade Center, they go, hmm, OK, don't know about that then. Um, but yes, it bears all the hallmarks of controlled demolition, and even though it wasn't hit by a plane, and so nobody knows what's happened to it, the 9-11 Commission never even addressed this issue. This is another reason we need an, a new independent inquiry. Um, and there are eyewitnesses saying there are explosions in the building in the morning. There's a whole mess of evidence that needs to be addressed. But I think, um, you know, it's, it's crucial to look at this with the idea that perhaps there was some at least pre-knowledge of what might happen. Um, certainly there are a number of intelligence whistleblowers and government whistleblowers who've come out and said, yes, we were aware that something was brewing, but we were blocked from investigating it in the US. Um, but if you think how 9-11 has been used and abused as well, one of the things I said earlier was that false flag attacks are carried out for political advantage by the, the, the real perpetrators. So who benefits from 9-11? You know, it uh, has been the perfect pretext for the ongoing endless war on terror, which is a justification for the wars in the Middle East, in which millions of people have died and been displaced. Uh, they estimate, I think, at the moment about 40 children a day are dying in Iraq because of what the West has done, which I is just... I believe the seen. Lancet estimated close to one million Iraqis yeah. have died yeah. needlessly because of the invasion of Iraq. Yeah. Yeah. The war is now spreading into Afghanistan. And Pakistan. I'm sorry, into yeah. Pakistan. Yeah. Yeah. At huge cost yeah. to the people there. Mm. And I don't mean financial cost. Mm. I mean lives lost. And yeah. It's obscene. It's obscene. And this is predicated on the issue of 9-11 and, you know, our hunt for al-Qaeda and the war on terror. But it affects all of us, you know. I mean, many people say, well, why are people looking at 9-11? It's an attack that happened many years ago in a foreign country. But think how it's been used against all of us as well. This pretext for the war on terror has led to the erosion of our civil liberties across the world. I mean, certainly in the UK, we no longer live in a functioning democracy. We've never had a written constitution, of course, like the US or most of other European countries. We've just had sort of traditional rights. But these have all disappeared because of the fight against terror, the terror threat. Now, bear in mind, the UK suffered terrorism on a regular basis from the um, IRA, the Irish Republican Army, throughout the 70s, 80s and 90s. We were used to bombs going off on a regular basis on our city streets and people dying. And yet none of our traditional freedoms were taken away at that point. And yet we have... Al-Qaeda, this terrible war on terror, and all our freedoms are shredded by a Labour government. We have people put in prison on the say-so of intelligence officers, no evidence whatsoever, just internment. We have British citizens being abducted and tortured in third world countries, and in interrogations in which MI5 officers apparently seem to be taking part as well, which is obscene. Um, we have 
police stopping and arresting people with no suspicion of them having committed a crime under Section 44 of the Terrorism Act, just because they want to find out what their identity is. We have um, a new eavesdropping law called uh, Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act from 2000, which is supposed to be just for um, agencies like MI5, for example, to, to put a telephone tap on to investigate a terrorist case. Over 800 public bodies now use Ripper to investigate people for a whole range of small civil infractions. So, for example, a town council might use this act to put a telephone tap to investigate someone to see if they are living in the house they say they are living in for council tax purposes or whatever. We've even had ridiculous cases where people who go and um, fish for shellfish off the south coast of England are under surveillance under this this very hard-hitting piece of legislation, purely to see if they're taking more than their quota of shellfish. <laughs> it's just it's crazy. And this was put in place to try and prevent, you know, protect us from terrorism. So you give them power, they will abuse it. That's a simple thing. And we've also uh, another law called the Civil Contingency Act, which just went through Parliament. The media didn't kick up a fuss, the MPs didn't kick up a fuss. And the provisions of that basically say that any government minister can declare a state of national emergency. And under that state of national emergency, there's no justification to Parliament or anything. That's it. Any government minister? Any government minister can sign a, an authorisation for a state of emergency. And under that, they can quarantine us. They can stop us moving freely around our country. Um, they can stop people having uh, the right of association, the right to have political meetings or whatever. They can even seize and demolish our homes and not pay us compensation because it's done in the name of national security. And most people don't even know this law exists. It came in three years ago. So when I say that the UK is effectively a police state, it is. The laws are in place. It's just they're not being used yes. in a really heavy-handed manner yet. And it's really sad having seen that happen to the country that was supposed to be the mother of democracies, you know. Now, I think there are similar laws in the United States. Mm, well, and, uh, Patriot Act. Yes. <laughs> That's a terrible and I have act. a feeling there are similar laws in Canada as mm -hmm, well. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I spoke to a lawyer Oh, five or six years ago, and she was talking about the laws that have been passed mm -hmm. in Canada since 9-11 and coming from 9-11, and she said these were basically the laws of Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. Now, we've heard nothing about them. Uh, most people don't know they exist, and I don't even know if they mm -hmm. exist, but as you say in Britain, mm -hmm. the laws are on the books. They just haven't yet been used um, well, some of them are being used. I mean, for example, the Section 44 of the Terrorism Act, where police can stop and arrest you just to find out who you are, with no suspicion of any crime having been committed, of course is being used and abused against the Muslim community. Um, tens of thousands of people are being stopped in this manner every year across the UK, predominantly, of course, young Muslim men which is just inherently racist anyway. Oh, you know, you happen to look Arab, let's stop. Plus, it makes people feel they're not part of Britain. Exactly. And it causes anger. Yeah. And possibly that's even the reason for doing it. Possibly, quite possibly. But, um, you know, it starts with one community and then spreads out. The Irish community was treated that way as well in the 1980s by the police, you know. So. A lot of the fear or anger in Britain came out of the bombings that took place on July 7th, 2005. Mm. Um, several people were killed. There was a 52, bus. 52, yeah. 52 people mm -hmm. were killed. A mm -hmm. bus and uh, in, the, in the underground. Yeah, there were four... Well, according to the official account, there were four explosions that day. Uh, three on underground trains, at the height of the rush hour, and one on the top deck of a double-deck bus which, of course, provided the sort of visuals of the attack. Um, now, it's interesting because I'm aware that false flag is a historic reality, it's a concept. I'm also very aware that there's a mountain of evidence which contradicts the official account of 9-11. Now, in the case of 7-7, as I said, you've always got to look at these attacks with a possibility of false flag in the back of your mind. There are some interesting issues and questions and anomalies about 7-7, but I don't think there's anywhere near as much evidence to dispute the official account, although one or two of the issues are in, you know, quite stark. The first one was that um, there's a man called Peter Power, who is a former senior counter-terrorism officer from the Metropolitan Police, who's now left and set up a security company called Visor Consultants. Now, he was running an exercise, a counter-terrorism-style exercise, in London on the day of the bombings. And he said, on live on national mainstream television and radio, in the immediate aftermath of the bombings, that his exercise involved precisely the same stations 
at precisely the same times as the bombs that went off, and the hair stood up on the back of his neck. That was the quote he said. Yes, I remember hearing that because yeah. a friend of mine taped it. Yeah. It's never been heard of again. Mm. And yet you'd think that that is quite a remarkable statement yeah. for someone to make. He backtracked, of course, yes. immediately. Yes. Um, you know, over the next few days, he downplayed that. But of course, it's all over the internet now. It's included in films and things like that. So it's there for posterity. But um, There seemed to be quite a bit of questions raised about mm. that those bomb all the bombers were killed. Allegedly. Allegedly. I mean, it's very handy, isn't it, having suicide bombers, because you don't have to put them on trial, so that you don't need to build a forensic evidential chain to take them to court. Um, the other anomaly, we've never had a public inquiry into what is the biggest terrorist atrocity in terms of fatalities on British soil, which is amazing. And that Tony, was the 7-7. That was the 7-7 bombing. 7th. Tony Blair dismissed the possibility, and he, called it a, it, he said it would be a ludicrous diversion, which is just bizarre. Anyway, the families of the victims and the survivors obviously want a proper inquiry to find out what happened and who was to blame and all the rest of it. And the government kept refusing and keeps refusing to this day. What they have allowed them is um, something they produced, a document they produced called the Official Narrative, which was written by an anonymous civil servant somewhere, which was presented to Parliament and which had to be changed immediately because they got the facts wrong such as crucial issues like which train the bombers were supposed to have taken from Luton, which is where they parked their car, into London. Now, the official narrative claimed that they took the 740 train. Some uh, researchers went to the train company and um, the train company has to keep records of which trains run and what time they get in for performance indicators. The train that day had been cancelled. Oh. So, and yet the official narrative the government produced said, oh yes, well, they got on this train and we have all these eyewitnesses that said they saw the bombers on that train and yet the train didn't run that day. So where are these oh, issues come from? Oh, we made a mistake and we'll just, just, uh, a little we'll just mistake. rewrite it. Who are all these witnesses though? Yes, That's exactly. the intriguing question. Now I read, it was a newspaper out of, it was Cambridge as a matter of fact, I mm -hmm. think. A friend showed me this. It was an account by somebody who had been injured in the attack, who was from Cambridge. Oh, yes, and yes. It, oh, you saw that, okay. I've and heard of this one, yeah. He moved yeah. to a hospital in Cambridge a few days later when he was okay to travel, and he was interviewed by a local reporter while he was in hospital in mm -hmm, Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And he said his recollection was that there was nobody who seemed to be of Arab descent on the sitting anywhere around where the bomb went off. Mm -hmm. And plus, as he was being taken off the train, he saw that... The floor of the car, the train car, had been blown upwards and inwards as if the bomb was underneath mm. the train, mm. attached to it, and blew up outside the train, attached to the bottom. The, that's how the explosion yeah, looked yeah. to no, him. I've heard that account. It was a man called Bruce Late, I think, who was a professional dancer who'd been on one of these TV shows, so he got quite a lot of coverage, I seem to remember. Um, I don't know. But this is why we need an inquiry. You know, yes. If there are conflicting witness, eyewitness accounts, they all need to be addressed. You can't just say, oh, well, someone said this happened, like the, the, the alleged witnesses on the 740 train that didn't exist, saying, oh, yes, we also saw these four Arab chaps. Well, where are they now? You know? um, so if there's, of course you need a proper inquiry. You need um, to pull together a forensic chain to sort of try and indicate exactly how it happened. Um, I don't. I really don't know about seven seven. All I say, there are some interesting unanswered questions about it, and we need a new inquiry. And for nine eleven, you would recommend, at the very least, an independent inquiry. Absolutely, take place. yeah. I mean, you know, there was this nine eleven commission, which the government refused to allow uh, for over four hundred days. I think you know they they start That's inquiries right. and commissions into. Bill Clinton's sexual proclivities, you know, and spend a huge amount of money on it, but they won't actually allow a commission into this huge attack on US soil. Um, the families forced them into it, of course. They really campaigned for one. Um, even the commissions of that said they were set up to fail, famously. <laughs> Can you repeat that? Because that's they, something I haven't really heard. Yeah, the um, Keenan Hamilton, the two chairs of the 9-11 commission, said that the commission was set up to fail. Um, and interestingly, of course, the executive director of the commissioner of the commission was a man called Philip Zelikow, who pretty much set the parameters of what the commission was going to investigate and look at and report, even to the extent of <clears throat> writing the structure of the report, the title headings, the subheadings, which areas they're going to write up about. Zelikow, of course, is one of the key neocons. He's right at the heart of that group. He's even co-authored books with Condoleezza Rice. 
and yet he was the one put in charge of defining where the Commission was going to investigate. So yes, of course, that hasn't answered most of the questions. They did not deal with most of the major anomalies in the official account, uh, in the official version of events. That's why we need a new independent account. And I would say the media is also totally complicit in that because mm. they could blow the whole official story out of the water in five minutes if they chose to do so. There was, I, I mean, uh, on the internet you can see mm -hmm. the, the day of 9-11, the reporters standing outside the buildings the, with the smoke pouring out of the top saying we can hear bombs going off. Mm -hmm. There are bombs going off inside the buildings right now. And all of that is somehow disappears from the public record, never to be mentioned again. It's magical, isn't it? It is magical. Mm -mm. You've, got, you've got to admire these guys. <laughs> you know, I mean, well, um, what can I say? The media is suborned, I think, into the sort of uh, going along with the official account. Because if they don't, if they start rocking the boat, they will lose their jobs. It's that simple. Yes, the people, mm. the people who work for the media, of mm -hmm. course, they're mm -hmm. just doing their job like everybody else. Well, they're not doing their job, are they? Well, yeah, there is that. <laughs> Um, of 9-11, what, what were the points that someone mentioned to you that made you begin to think that there was a problem with the official story? Um, I think when I looked at it to begin with, it was the issues around the Pentagon, um, the, <coughs> the, the incredibly small hole in the yes. facade before it collapsed, which intrigued me. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and also the collapse of the Twin Towers, which was free fall speed again. And you have two planes going in at the top of the towers, and yet they collapse into their own footprint really fast, and it just seemed a bit odd. And of course, since then, there have been various papers published by scientists, peer-reviewed scientific papers, that suggest that um, a highly sophisticated, very modern type of explosive may have been used to bring the towers down. It's called nanothermite, I believe. There was a paper just recently released by uh, Professor Niels Harrit of Copenhagen University, he's a chemistry professor, um, looking at this, and peer-reviewed, solid evidence. But, of course, that's just dismissed because it's, oh, 9-11 truth movement, who cares? Nothing in the media. Nothing in the media, of course. Oh, no, actually there was. He, got a main, he, he was actually interviewed on mainstream du uh, Danish uh, news television. And he blew the interviewer away. I mean, the guy didn't, you know, really know what to make of it. So that was interesting, but not internationally, no. So what, what are the lessons that we can learn from this? And what are the directions we have to go in to begin to turn this around? Because, uh, you know, f I mean, it's my belief, and I guess your belief too, that mm. some very powerful people, um, and... and are doing things which are not necessarily in the best interests of all of us. Indeed, <laughs> they're in their own interests. Um, I think we just need to keep educating people about the fact there are questions around 9-11, that it's not as cut and dried as we've been told, and also to tell them, you know, look at it as something that is continuing to affect the global population of humanity to this day, either with wars or with um, erosion of our freedoms. I mean, we need to look at it. And um, because 9-11 was so high profile, everyone remembers where they were when it happened. It was a shock and awe exercise, you know, to frighten us all. We can use it back, you know, we can push back and say, actually, this is a sort of keystone in the sort of edifice of, of lies about how the media control things and the government spins and things like that. If we can disprove 9-11, bang, out, then people will start investigating other issues for themselves and start questioning for themselves rather than just passively thinking about, oh, well, that's the news, I'm going to just ingest it and that's it. And I think this is an amazing movement of people um, around the planet with many, many experts, but also many millions of concerned citizens asking questions about this because it re-empowers them democratically. You know, most of us have been so turned off by mainstream politics because what's the point? You know, they never change, they never listen to activists. 9-11 can get people thinking for themselves, doing their own research, following their own paths of what interests them as well, but at least gets that initial process thinking, of thinking about, yes, I've been lied to, yes, I don't trust my government, and this is a key element of why I don't. You know, it's very easy to show people the evidence, and if they get over their emotional resistance to the issue, it's very difficult for anyone to go back and say, OK, I know the evidence, but I don't believe it. You can't. The evidence is too strong. So the movement itself is an amazing um, community of people. I've never seen a political organisation quite like it, really, or political in the sort of strict civic sense. And um, we just need to get people as active as possible. Now, uh, my understanding is that millions of Canadians and probably tens of millions of Americans, and I, I don't know what the case is in Britain, 
don't believe the official version of 9-11. Mm. Uh, would, what, what's the situation in Britain when, when the Brits talk about it? What, you know, do they laugh at it and, or, do they, or do people believe? Or I guess there's a mix, but... There is a mix. There's never been a poll, I don't think, yeah. that showed how many, what sort of percent it might have There was a poll done in New York City. Yeah. Several years ago on the eve of the Republican National Convention when Bush was re-nominated, uh, you know, five years ago mm -hmm. to run. And it was done by Zogby, which is one of the largest polling companies in the United States. And it found that in New York City, full, I think it was 49% of the people either believed that the U.S. government was involved in it and complicit mm -hmm. or knew it was going to happen and let it happen for their own mm -hmm. purposes. Yeah. It's quite a remarkable. And yet it doesn't matter. No, of course The lies not. continue. Yeah. Now, in the UK, um, over the last few years, we did build a very successful campaign for a while. Uh, we had a lot of high-profile speakers over, people like William Rodriguez, who is the last man out of the Twin Towers, helped save hundreds of lives. Um, you know, amazing, amazing man. Got a lot of local media and some good national media coverage as well. And there was a growing awareness, not just through those tours and the official groups, but also spreading the word on the internet. So I'm sure a lot of people are very aware. But there has been a sort of concerted pushback within the mainstream media. Oh, well, you know, anyone who questions 9-11, of course, is a nutter, you know, conspiracy theorist, anti-Semitic, you know, all these sort of stupid labels tagged onto a movement of concerned citizens. So there's been quite a pushback in the media. And I think that frightens more people off because, you know, they worry about credibility of people going to laugh at me if I look at these sort of issues, which is difficult. And the movement as well doesn't always help itself by being aggressive or by speculative theories around what might have happened that day. It's not for us to prove what happened that day. It's for an independent inquiry to prove what happened that day. So we can shoot ourselves in the foot a little bit as well. But also the rest of Europe is it's growing very fast. We have um, very active groups across all the main countries in Europe now. Uh, we have a member of the European Parliament called Giulietta Chiesa, who made a very good film called Zero. I don't know if you've seen it. Yes, yes, I have seen very it. Very good um, basic film, just raising the basic evidence that questions the official account. And he managed to get that screened on um, Russian national state TV on the last anniversary. Went out to about 30 million people. Then the Russian newspapers were writing articles the next day. Play, you know, newspapers like Pravda, that used to be the mouthpiece of the Soviet infrastructure, saying things like, oh, of course we all know that America gets involved in false flag terrorism. This isn't news to us. <laughs> so there are many millions of people, I think, across Europe who are aware. Whether they do something about it is another matter, become active. But at the very least, if they just talk about it amongst their peer groups and their friends and their community and spread the word, that's a start, I think. So you're now on, well now when we film this but not now when it's mm. when this is being shown on television you're on a tour of canada that's right you yeah. spoke in vancouver last night mm -hmm. you're speaking in victoria tomorrow mm -hmm. where are you going from here i'm going over to ottawa montreal and um toronto hamilton and waterloo well, that's quite a how about in the united states anything there uh not in the no nothing lined up i spoke in california a couple of places last autumn okay. which went really well that was great fun You've written a book? I wrote a book many years ago, yes, in uh, 2003. It's called Spies, Lies and Whistleblowers, which was a sort of um, aggregation of all the disclosures we made about MI5, what we saw going wrong, but also what happened after the whistleblowing years in terms of the official response and quite how bad it was, um, which was not touched by the mainstream media. Spy books are so rare in the, U in the UK, they always get a lot of coverage, but this time they banned it. They banned any reviews in the mainstream media. I had friends in the media saying, yes, we're not allowed to touch this book, so it was buried. And um, MI5 actually banned its publication for about a year and a half as well. I had to submit it for clearance, otherwise I would have been prosecuted, and they just stopped, you know, kept it under wraps for a long time. So that was a bit frustrating. Mm. So you're up against very powerful very powerful interests, as are we all. We're yeah. all up against these exactly. interests. Exactly. If, I was going to say as well, if people are interested in um, these sort of issues, there's quite a lot of uh, more information, um, interviews, writing, what have you, on my website, which is just www.anniemachon.com. So it's A-N-N-I-E-M-A-C-H-O-N.com. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. And is there any message uh, that you... Try to, besides telling the stories, is there any message that you're giving to people in Canada that you want us to draw from what's happened to you or what you've been involved in? I think what happened to, to David Shaler and myself and what we've been involved in uh, displays all the elements of what we're up against in terms of uh, the media control, in terms of cover-ups, in terms of spin and things like that. Um, and I think that's what we're facing on a sort of macro scale now in terms of trying to uncover 
the basis for the war on terror and cover what's happened in the Middle East and stop the slide into totalitarianism, which we're seeing in our democracies at the moment. So really all I'm doing is bearing witness, I suppose, to the fact that these things go on. I've seen it from the inside um, in an attempt to try and help people understand that it's, you know, they need to look at issues like 9-11. Um, because these sort of issues do go on, these sort of um, false flag operations do go on, they are a reality. Um, so it's really just encouraging people to take that mental leap, to say, okay, I'm going to have a look, do the research for myself, and see where I go from there. And if they are so moved, to get active and plug into their communities and spread the word, um, and just, you know, let's get a healthy, healthy, thriving democracy going again. Our politicians have got away with it for long enough. We know that they're not doing the right job, they're, they're corrupt, they've taken us into illegal wars on the basis of lies. Let's say enough is enough, we want our countries back. Thank you, uh, thank you, Annie Michon. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching, and this has been Face to Face. We've been talking to Annie Michon, who uh, was a whistleblower who left MI5, and um, I think has some very important information that all of us should be paying heed to. Uh, there's a lot of questions that have been asked here today and uh, I think it requires on all of our parts that we really open our minds to what is true and what isn't and do the best we can to protect uh, at least the remnants of democracy that we have left here in Canada and to try to rebuild uh, the great country that, uh, that we could and can be. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.